Good morning, everyone. Thank you for getting up on a Sunday morning at 8 a.m. and being here. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting presentation and a very pertinent topic today. My name is Randy Shively. Um, I co-chair the Substance Use Disorder Committee for ACA. So I've got a vested interest in this topic, and um, I think you'll learn a lot today. A couple announcements. One is this is being filmed and taped in here. So if you don't mind silencing your cell phones and just being careful not to make any loud noises because it will get taped. <laughs> so I appreciate that. I um, want to introduce our speaker today. I'm your moderator, and I would appreciate it if you fill out your evaluation forms at the end, and I'll pick them up. Harbenz Diol, he's the, currently the Deputy Director of Health Services for the Nebraska Department of Corrections. Um, Harbon's got his PhD from New York University. He got his Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine from Des Moines University. Did his residency at Yale in telemedicine, which I bet was very interesting. Um, from 2004 to 2016, he worked as a health service administrator in Iowa. And then he moved and to Nebraska and in 2017, um, became their um, medical director. And then quickly, I guess he got a um, uppance there and got a promotion to deputy director of health services. And I talked to Harbons a little earlier and um, he inherited kind of a mess that I think he had to work through with a lot of mentally, seriously mentally, mentally ill people um, being sent to him. Uh, he had no choice but to take them and had to, had to make a good, um, system out of one that was kind of chaotic at the time. So I think he'll have a lot of good insights for us. I think we're all aware of the mental health crises and corrections, um, and we have to be responsive and realize that um, we're dealing with some pretty sick people sometimes that need our help desperately. So with that, Harbons, come on up. And um, the title today is Medical Effects of K2 and Synthetic Drugs, Not Your Grandfather's Marijuana. Good morning, everyone. I have to give you credit for getting up at 8 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. This is kind of awesome. But it's also a very pertinent topic that we need to address. Um, as Randy talked about, I didn't realize Midwest states were really facing with K2s uh, problems. So I'm sure every state has the same problem. How many of you are from a medical field? Anybody from the administration? Security? Okay. So one of the things we talked about, as Randy uh, uh, alluded to the fact that uh, for Behavioral Health Committee, Substance Use Disorders, and I'm a chair of the Healthcare Committee, so we decided last year that we should really talk about K2. Uh, I don't know about you, when I went to Nebraska, we, were, we had about, in one day, or one weekend, we had about 12 different trips to the emergency room. And you can imagine what do you do, the nurses were just putting fires out, going back and forth, and nobody had any idea what to do with it. And you know, obviously, the, the testing for K2 is, is not there, so people are really uh, encouraged to use it and figure that, hey, you can't really write me any infractions because I'm using K2 because the test comes out negative. Well, the problem was for us is that really how do you identify the symptoms? And the symptoms are part of it that, you know, they were very all over the place. Uh, and, you know, try to tell our patients to say, you know, this is very dangerous. And they really don't really think about it because they see the colleague going down on the floor and th their reaction is this must be really good stuff. And it's not gonna happen to me, right? You probably heard that all, all over the time. And one of the things that we had to learn the hard way was there, how do you identify the symptoms? Because it could be a heart attack, it could be something else, it could be a stroke. Uh, somebody's have abdominal pain, vomiting, all the stuff, right? You've seen all those things. Uh, so one of the things we decided to do was that, well, we'll train our nurses and our nurses are very good, they pick up some of the things, and I think you should probably think about the same things, and you can watch them, monitor for a little bit, and they get better. But that's, when you're in the trenches, that's a very scary part to do. Imagine telling nurses that, hey, we're gonna watch this guy for a little bit, and he's gonna get better, and we'll just put him back in his cell, or put him in a skill area. Uh, but we learned the hard way, and it got to a point where, I'll show you some of the videos with some of the things that happened today for, for, taken from Nebraska system. So the, the topic of this, my, my talk is really the medical side effects. We really don't talk about the medical side effects. The, the data that's coming out is still pretty new, uh, but it is out there. 
One of the things that scares me the most, not only the synthetic cannabinoids, but it's also what they're laced with. Uh, because I think that we know China is exporting, or whatever you want to call it, lots of fentanyl. And we have no idea what the concentration of fentanyl is. Uh, and if you're alluding to the fact that this is only straight synthetic ca cannabinoid, you're really mistaken. They have lots of other components in it. So be careful of what you do and how you screen them. And there is really no good way to screen it. I mean, I was just talking to a gentleman from Arkansas. Uh, you know, they use drones to drop those things off. They throw it over the, over the fence. What do you do? Uh, staff brings it, right? That's, that's a part of the system. Security is really inundated with how do you screen everybody else. But we have to do something. You know, the question comes up. It is coming to the system. We have it. Uh, inmates really think that the stuff is really potent. It's not going to happen to me. And we'll continue to use the uh, medications. I don't know how many of you use Narcan in your system. Uh, we started implementing Narcan at every housing unit now to say, you know, if nothing else, just give them a shot. It's not going to hurt. Uh, but truly, the benzos, the narcotics are using it. When you give Narcan for those guys, they don't like it because it wakes them up pretty quickly. The other guys that really have no effect. So we'll talk about the medical side effects, mostly just, you know, sticking to that part of it because there are lots of conferences here, uh, Randy's going to be talking about uh, synthetic as well, but a different aspect of it. So we try to cover all aspects from security to the medical and what we, you know, how do you respond to it. So the first slide shows, uh, you know, the, who uses synthetic cannabinoids? Do we really have any idea how, many, how much is out there? And this, is, this actually talks about the longitudinal study talking about 19,000 related posts. And this study was done from 2008 to 2015 to see who are the people are using it, and why are they using it? You know, we get all different types of reasons. And we talk about, well, we use it because I want to get high. And, you know, get hallucinations. I get this euphoric feeling, and I just love it. Uh, and that's what happens. So this is what the response that we got from about 44% of people saying they, they want to get high. You know, this is what they like it. You know, that's what people tell us, right? They want to forget all those things and see what happens. And 10.8% had actually hallucinations. What's interesting about this study was, that the more you use it, they have a worse negative effect. So when they talked about getting high and euphoric feeling, the more K2 was used, or the synthetic cannabinoids, that actually decreased. Now the negative side effects actually increased. So all of a sudden you're faced with talking about people who have anxiety, nausea, and overdose issues. I d we have not had any overdose deaths in my state. I don't know about your state. Have you had any overdose from K2? And I think it's just a matter of time it's gonna happen. We've been lucky. Uh, partly is we're trying to be much more proactive, and we, when we find somebody has some symptoms of those things, we just start IV therapy right away. And it's, you know, it's easy, great to give lorazepam and Haldol too. I don't know if you have those capabilities to do it, but the problem comes is, what do you do at night? You know, you don't have enough staff to do all those things. You have, you know, putting a lot of different files. So that's one of the things they found out, and that the anxiety, uh, nausea, and overdose actually effects went up. The problem with our patients is that, well, this is a synthetic drug, this is natural stuff, so we're going to use it, right? And of course, we know the synthetic generates more harms, but people who are using it, they don't believe it. And I think hopefully today we'll convince you that there are serious side effects to the to synthetic cannabinoids. So what is the stuff that we're talking about? Look at the names they use, K2. I like Mr. Miyagi, right? <laughs> and it talks about, you know, of course, you get Scooby Snacks. Uh, and of course, you know, obviously people thinking about uh, annihilation, you know, so obviously somebody who gave that name knows it's a pretty dangerous stuff. But also, you know, spicing your life, you know, we're talking about this is actually, it's a natural product. So, and, and I don't remember anywhere looking at literature that talks about this is safe for human consumption. You know, it does say on the labeling that it's not safe, yet people still use it. You know, so what, what happened? How do we educate our, our inmates to say, hey, look, this is dangerous, guys. This is, but, you know, addictive personality and all that stuff and people who want to get high, they think that it's not going to happen to them. Uh, and this is what I hear time and time after to say, hey, you know, the stuff must be really good. I mean, we had actually a case where the cellmate actually passed out on the floor and the, in the, the, his cellie said, well, you know, this is great stuff. I think I should use it. And you're telling him, him, look, see what happened to him. He's frothing in the mouth. He might not make it. Oh, no, no, it won't happen to me. You know, part of the other problem is that we don't know the concentration. We don't know what, the, what else is laced with it. So be very careful of it. It's not 
pure synthetic cannabinoids. We know there's a lot of stuff that doesn't uh, mix with it. Um, black mamba is a great name too, growing up in Africa. So, you know, we dealt with a lot of snakes and black mambas and all that stuff. So, imagine what the names are coming from. They're very creative about this thing. So, one of the, one of the things I want to talk about is when we talk to our staff and educate them, they're talking about this is a natural product. It really is not going to hurt them. You know, they're talking about, look, we've legalized marijuana in so many states, and it's natural. Uh, but people don't remember, even if it's a natural product, it depends how you process the stuff. Uh, you know, if we think about the, uh, uh, the oil being approved for epilepsy, yes, this whole process goes through it, but there are other different processes that you we look, look at it too. So, so you know, even, even a, a, a cannabinoid itself has got a, about 114 different components, and that's all related to the processing. If you process a certain way, you get a different products. So they really, even they're buying this for smoking, they have no idea what they're getting into. So this is kind of interesting. The new names that we're going to talk about is uh, Kratom and Salvia Divinorum and Metaxetamine and Peppers and Derivatives. So what are these products? Let's go one by one. So Kratom is actually a plant derivative from Southeast Asia. It belongs to Mitrogenia speciosa. So now you guys say, well, what is this medical word? What is this terminology? Give me a break. It's the same plant as coffee and gardenia. You know, so if coffee is safe for you, why not this is safe for me as well? Um, the salvia divinorum is a hallucinogen. How many of you remember the shamans from South America? Anybody heard of the word shaman? You know, they use this as some of the hallucinogenic for conscious awareness experience because a lot of people go from US to South America to get that experience. And it's the good part of that is a short-acting drug, so, but you do get that hallucinogenic effect when you come back and say, man, I had a great experience. Well, I bet you did, you know, but the question is, they think it's kind of a consciousness, of, but it's the drug that's doing it. Uh, have you heard of the drug ketamine? Remember it was anesthetic that was used for sedation? Guess what? A methoxetamine is kind of a derivative of ketamine, natural product. So it's being used as a legal ketamine to get that high. Of course, this can cause loss of toxicity as well if you're not used properly. And I'll show you a video of this that kind of reminds you of what, what, this, what the stuff looks like. And uh, peppers and derivative, I wouldn't bore you too much about this one. This is talks about the resurgence of uh, 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 legal ecstasy. You know, we were back in the 70s. Remember the LSD was popular in the 60s? Uh, so this is one way of to make a derivative out of this stuff. So let's talk about the Kratom by itself. So we talked about this came from Southeast uh, uh, Asia, and it belongs to the same family that would be a shared family for just as coffee and gardenia. So people think about if coffee is safe, uh, gardenia is safe, why not this product as well? And there is some truth to it. You know, the, some of the products from the, the naturally derived, actually in smaller doses, it's, it's like an opioid effect. So you do get some relief from pain or so, uh, but in higher doses, that actually becomes more of a euphoric. So they use it as a stimulant and it lasts for a while, it, there's effects are there, and that does help. So obviously, you know, we, what do we, I think we have a, what is five hour power drink? You know, we kind of manufacture those things, so why not South America, Southeast Asia, they use these natural products, talking about to increase the energy, stamina, and limit fatigue. And it does work to a certain level, but the question comes up, what else are you mixing it with? So this has been commonly used for pain, uh, and most recently, the CDC kind of put out a, a data back in February 2018 that this product was linked to salmonella infection in 20 states. So this is how common it is. It is not only we talk about it in the correctional world, it's also outside the world. So people still use it. And, you know, of course, you know, whatever you call it, there are some benefits to it. Uh, and, but depending how you use this, you know, anything in excess is going to cause some problems, right? So we have to be careful of those. Uh, the next one is salvia divinorum. I kind of like this one because really in South America they use it as legally for to, to, you know, to cause this visionary state of consciousness. Uh, you know, I prefer meditation. I can just do meditate and do the same conscious level, but that takes much more discipline and all that. So here it tells you, again, it's a product that you just take a pill and I'm going to get this consciousness uh, uh, into my spiritual healing process. And this is what is being used in South America legally. And actually we... Uh, I had a friend of mine's daughter went to South America about four years ago. Uh, she had an episode of, I guess, life changing in her life, decided to go to South America, spend all her money, and spend a weekend with shamans. 
and she does not remember anything that happened for that 24, 48 hours because they were just all taking some kind of a product like this. And she said, oh, this really was safe. It was made out of a bark of a tree, so it couldn't be a drug. So this is how we are being fooled across the world to say this is a product coming from a plants and trees, but it's not a bad drug for you, you know, depending how you use it. So this, the good part about the Mazatec shamans use this to facilitate a visionary st uh, a consciousness, state of consciousness uh, during the spiritual healing, because a lot of people do go for this process. Southeast Asia, also the same thing. Uh, the good part of this is it's a short acting. Uh, it's rapid onset. You know, you take it, comes out in less than four hours. But depending how much you take it, you know, the, the shamans, I think the ritual process is there almost four or five hours. Uh, they feed you a meal, you kind of have a nice tent out in the, in, a, you know, in the forest. And of course, once you take the, the drug, you know, you're hallucinating all over the place. And one of the side effects actually that she talked about was a lot of people were actually vomiting. Uh, so it depends how somebody reacts to it. But it's out there, we do use it. And uh, I wouldn't recommend you to get, kind of go to, to facilitate your visionary state of consciousness. There are better ways of doing it. Meditation is one, but you gotta be disciplined to do those things. It does help. Uh, but this is, this is out there as well. So most of our patients actually think about using it, and why not? So methotaxamine, uh, uh, we talked about similar to ketamine. Now this is the one that actually causes some of the uh, uh, toxicity in the cerebral uh, portion of our brain. Uh, it's acutely reversible, which is, which is the good part, but they have been actually documented in three cases that uh, probably had some uh, irreversible damage. And I'll show you a video that really talks about how the K2 affects it. And I don't know about your experience in Europe where you are, every K2 that you're using, a person that experience is different. We really don't know how different, there is really, you know, if you take a, um, opioids, for example, we know what's gonna happen. But with K2 and the synthetic ones that are done, the side effects are really totally different in how people react to it. And, and that's why it's so complicated in our system that one person takes K2 would have actually nausea, vomiting, and throwing up. The other person just kind of have a seizure and just drops right dead on, on, your, on the table that he had, was sitting on. And then you figure out what happened here too. So people react totally differently. Uh, the other one that's a chemical derivative, uh, derivative is a benzene ring. Uh, actually being replaced with a carbon molecule with, with, with a, a nitrogen. I really won't bore you with the chem chemical structure of that stuff, but this is a very common ring for uh, uh, basis for der deriving a recreational use product. So it's out there, people do manufacture this, it's easy to do. Um, but it, they are dangerous, the concentration, we don't really know about these things. So what happens? You know, synthetic cannabis report, which is kind of interesting, we, t we talked about like, okay, what are you guys, why are you using it? You know, we know synthetic cannabinoid is, has the same kind of receptor as the uh, cannabinoid um, that's manufactured in 29 different states. But they talk, really, they tell us they're using it because it elevates their mood. They like it. You know, it makes them feel better. Uh, our society is getting more complicated and people have lots more different stresses. They talk about if any drug I can take that's gonna make me better, why not? And of course, it's also talk about relaxation. Again, there are better ways of relaxing, right? Praying works, meditation works, Put, putting some light music works, but why not I'll just take a little pill that's gonna help me relax? Um, you know, especially the job that we do, you know, how difficult job yours is. And of course, the stress that we have comes from the people we take care of. And of course, they have the same stress because they gotta follow the structure, right? They don't want to be where they want. They want to be the, that we put them there. We didn't put them there. We just take care of them. Um, and, and but I think that's the impression that they have. Of course, they also talk about the alter perception. They really just don't want to know where they are. They just want to get the time done uh, in just somewhere conscious state of mind and not worry about where we are. And that's the easy way to 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 look at it. But they don't. They, they forget. You know, the, your perception alterations can cause some damage, biochemical damage in, the, in your body as well. Uh, symptoms of psychosis. You know, some people can probably tolerate pretty well. Some people don't. So, how many of you do you think the synthetic cannabis is addictive? Any ideas? I know this is a totally new information for us. There's one. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't think it's addictive. You know, this is so. And, and the, the, the danger part of this is, is the, the symptoms they have are so unpredictable. 
I mean, if you can give the same drug, just two, two or three different people, they're gonna react differently. Uh, let me see if I can load the video up here. This guy on our system, walking in the video camera, they just did the K2. It's about two minutes to watch the, 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 the tape of how interesting it is. All of a sudden, they're walking around like zombies. You really have no idea where they are. Um, this guy is trying to get a balance, and this is the cerebellum uh, toxicity we talked about earlier. The good, good part is reversible, uh, so it does happen. And look at the gentleman on the, the bottom left of the screen. He's trying to balance himself, and then finds the other guy is not moving. He's almost catatonic state. Well, maybe I should go ahead and help him. So it's almost like walking on a ship, right? Trying to figure, find a balance there. <laughs> But you know, look at he wants to try to help the other guy, and it just he just can't move it. And they'll tell you when you talk to these guys what happened. They're conscious, they're aware of what's going on, but their body doesn't react to it. And the muscles they're trying to do, all of a sudden they've lost the connection in the brain. And he keeps going. They look at the other guy standing at the door. I bet if I ask you to stand like that for two minutes, you won't be able to do it. You know, he's really standing like that on his hamstrings and trying to hold on to that. I mean, to you and stand like that in 30 seconds is a long time, right? And if you can do that more than 30 seconds, pretty good shape. Uh, so just keep watching and see what happens. I mean, he stands there forever, it seems like. And the other guy kind of goes further up, and we all of a sudden we'll see him disappear. He goes into somebody's room. And, <laughs> and you watch about a minute. Whoever his room he got into, he throws him out. It's just like a sack of potatoes. Let's get out of my room. And nobody's really doing anything, right? Nobody's going to help. Look, everybody's going to walk by. Well, this is it. This is the video cameras there. This is like one of the uh, uh, minimum uh, oh, co co yeah, community, co community correction center. Well, you can just visit that now. No? You can get, get a tour through that Right. And watch it. So probably, you know. A couple of minutes. A couple of minutes. Yeah. Sure. But look, I mean, he's still struggling. He's still trying to stay out. And finally, he just kind of falls down and flat on his face. Yeah, and he's like saying, well, what is this stuff? This is like a praying position that I get into sometimes. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I, wouldn't, I would talk about more about it, how it happens. So, so he goes down, you know, the, the, and then he watched the further up the guy. Something will happen. The guy is thrown out of the room, and people do walk by. Nothing happens. So this is the kind of what you're looking at, the side effect. I mean, it's not fun. You're walking by. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know. I mean, probably what we have, I think what we see it is we see a lot of K2. Uh, it's too, <laughs> see? <laughs> out of my room, I don't want you anymore. So again, you know, what do you do? Like if you were, if, if you were a CEO, a correctional officer, going to say, okay, this guy who's laying down probably just dropped dead. You know, just died, I have no idea. You know, what do you call the medical? And the other person up there too, now we're going back to the same slide. And the other person actually talks about like, what happened? I'm hallucinating, walking, I don't even know where I'm going. And they have no idea. And this is really what's kind of dangerous part of the process is. So those are the things we talk about medical side. What about the psychotic side effects? You know, of course when they get, I mean, they're telling us they're using this because they want to have some hallucinations, they want to have relaxation, they want to have some other anxiety prone. But these are the side effects that include extreme anxiety, paranoia, confusion, and hallucinations. And these are really well documented in medical literature right now. So it's, it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, so this is, so how did we get started with all this stuff, right? Back in 2000, it was legal in Europe. They were buying those bath salts for whatever reasons. And somehow somebody decided this is a non- I was thinking of a bath so I could just put it in my bath and take it and get a relaxation. But of course, there was a different use for it. And of course, then it, then it came down to the US, and people thought it was a legal form of marijuana. And what's interesting about this one is all the names we talked about K2, Mr. Miyagi, you know, uh, Annihilation, uh, or Spice, these, they thought it was just the same as, you know, uh, uh, cannabinoid, uh, that you, uh, marijuana that you buy from other states. But technically, these are really synthetic ones that you can manufacture it. And the receptors that they use, I won't get too much detail into the receptor portion, but the, the THC from the cannabinoid receptor is the same one the synthetics attached to. 
So that's what you get, the side effects of those two. So there are some, you know, receptors one and two, the two receptors that attach, and we have a lot of receptors across the, in our system, in our body. So, and that's just like the active co component of marijuana. Of course, everybody uses it because why? We can't detect it, right? I use it, military was, it's very common in military in the 2000s. Um, and the young adolescents say, hey, I could use it, I'm not, nobody's gonna catch me. And still, even today, that's the, what people tell us, you know? Whether you use the drug testing or the swabs, it, we can't detect this one. You know, the new tests are coming out, but the, the sensitivity and the specificity is so low that it really doesn't work well spending that kind of money yet. Uh, but we can just tell by symptoms what's going on. These are easily synthesized, but they're not safe. Um, of course, people think it's an alternative we use, so this probably should be pretty good for me. So what about the health, uh, health, health uh, effects, side effects? You know, invariably we see blood pressure going up, heart rate's going up, we have seen vomiting, you know, we've seen violent behavior. I'll show you a study that's actually had a self-harm and suicide behavior in a, in a, in a patient. Now remember, all well, the studies are not done in corrections, these are from outside the world. So he was in the emergency room for a suicide attempt, did not remember it. So, you know, the violent behavior, suicidal thoughts, they have no idea what's going on. And uh, of course, epilepsy is pretty common, seizure disorders. And what scares our staff members is that when they see these kind of symptoms, remember, it could be heart attack, right? It could be stroke. I mean, you don't want to say, this is K2, I just will watch them. You can't watch them in these facilities. Uh, I mean, I've been in two different states. As a, as a you know, medical director, I know what the states, some of the states are, what the facilities all look like. And of course, Nebraska is a small town, in a small state, rural uh, community. We don't have enough nurses. I mean, I don't know if you have nurses, then if you do have access to nurses, send them my way. <laughs> you know, I'll certainly observe some of the nurses there. But it is kind of scary, you know, when, you, when you're putting out, you know, you have a facility that's a thousand inmates and one person goes down like this, then you have no idea what you do. And that's why we issued the K2 uh, in our units to say just to give them a shot. You know, offices will automatically do that. For those, for the, for, for those of you in the medical field, I don't know if you remember the Narcan, I mean, I talk about the K2's Narcan, that 10 years ago, it was pretty controlled in an ER setting. You know, now we're giving out EpiPens to Narcan to say, here, just go ahead, don't worry about it. I remember when I worked in the ER, I was like nervous using Narcan at the time to reverse somebody's opiate, opiate you know, uh, overdose stuff. But now, you see how times have changed? All of a sudden, we just say, hey, not a big deal, let's just give them a shot. So these are the health side effects. And uh, much more documented in, set, in, 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 in essence, so we know what's going on. So here's a question that I asked you guys before. Are synthetic cannabinoids addictive? You know, we get headache, anxiety, depression, irritability. Well, those are not addictions, right? But my assistant who prepared the slides for me was pretty clever, so he's gonna say, yes, they are addictive. Yeah, they are funny, you know. So it is, they are addictive. We might not recognize that there is, you know, even though we talked about some of the, uh, the ketamine type effects are uh, reversible, some of the ones that we really don't even know if they're reversible changes. So like meth, it's not reversible. You know, you damage your neurons, that's never gonna come back. Uh, so depending what component you're using it. So let me show you a video of about having psycho psychotic breakthrough type. Can you hear this? So this is somebody who took K2, started screaming out, hallucinating. Our office is really collecting a team. And he knows what it is. When he radios somebody else, it's a K2 use. See, our staff knows it's K2. I mean, how do they know it? Because we have so many episodes like this. But this is what happens. This is really scary. And it's scary for the patient too, right? He's by himself, has no idea what's going on. Uh, nope. So it is, it is pretty, pretty dangerous. You know, I mean, when we try to respond to these codes and uh, system needed, really you don't even know where you're going and look at the side effects that people have. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 it's really, 
we have to train our staff. Unfortunately, the states that we have seen too many of this K2 incidents, your staff, staff is already trained. Actually, I did an interview on, in a Nebraska newspaper talking about how do you manage K2 guys. And I told them nurses already know what the symptoms are and side effects are. The good part is that if it's once episode or twice the person is using, it's pretty, pretty quickly with some uh, symptomatic treatment, IV fluids and all that, we can reverse it, we can stabilize the patients. But we really don't know the long-term effects, so what's gonna happen down the road. And that's what kind of makes it much more dangerous. So look at this one, the widespread availability of K2. But why are we today talking about it? Because we don't know that. We don't know the side effects. You know, we are really unfamiliar with this drug. We have never been taught about these things. We've never taught it, I don't know about medical school, we never talked about these recreational drugs. We always talk about alcohol and other, the other things. Uh, but now the technology has changed so much and the states are legalizing marijuana and for sometimes for political reasons and sometimes, you know, the, the, especially the oil for epilepsy, but we really don't know the long-term effects of the even smoking pot is. We do know some of it, but anecdotal data, but really this, this control studies are not done out there. Uh, of course, you know, these are called bath salts, has increased in uh, emergency visits for agitation, um, you know, toxicity, and actually they have been uh, reported some deaths. CDC reported uh, this year, from 2011 to 15, they had three deaths. And the ER visit we talked about for toxicity, within the same period, there were 42,000 requests for toxic, toxic analysis that we sent up to the toxicology lab. Now think about 42,000 you know, samples were sent out. I think that numbers are probably low. We don't even know how many, how many samples are sent to toxicology uh, labs for analysis. And, the, and some of the things we don't even know what they are. We don't even detect it. And, but they're still being sent out there. So I still continue doing the same thing, make sure we do the right things, right? Even though we, I, one of the things I wanna make sure that you understand the side effects of medically, but don't lose sight of it that we can't give up. We gotta still continue to do the right things in, in, the, pro, in the process. Just to ignore, don't ignore it to say, oh, it's K2, it's gonna get better. We really don't know. Because acute phase is a lot different than the chronic phase. So, so when we talk about the, uh, the review of the uh, adverse effects, this is the data was back in 2014. And they looked at actually every hospital visits, ER visits, you know, drug rehab, and also asked the self-reporting stuff, you know, what kind of symptoms did you have and what, what did you have. There were 256 reports uh, and 106 uh, st uh, studies that were done, 400 cases involving 26 deaths. So even though we don't see as many deaths as we think we are, there are quite a few. Uh, and they are serious, we really don't even know, you know, what the, what, what the deaths are from. And I'm not even sure the medical examiners put down on the death certificates if something that's there because the side effects we have from substance abuse using, you know, you could have a hypertensive episode, you have a stroke and, you know, and I'll show you some of the data, it's all over the place, which is really impressive in a sense how it, how it occurs. Of course, cardiovascular events, you know, we will think about that. We've, we've known from our previous data on cocaine use that it does affect your heart, right? It also increases your heart rate. Uh, kidney, uh, AKI is acute kidney injury. I mean, we have some data that actually damages your kidneys. Um, we know we talked about seizure disorders, and of course, psychiatric psych you know, psychosis breakthrough with the presentation and the hyperemesis. Now, the hyperemesis is actually is very common with uh, using ca ca regular cannabis too. Uh, and also, the other side effect of using regular cannabis is hot feeling. And one of the things we, when we was doing some of the studies, we looked at a lot of emergency rooms are complaining about people coming in, they say, you know, I take baths about eight, nine times a day. So they always kind of say, ask him about marijuana use. If they're using marijuana, that's what he was from. But in the meantime, the ER was doing all the studies to figure out what's going on, and, all the, and nothing really panned out. So when they f kind of went back to uh, asking that history, that helped them quite a bit. And majority of these people are young males, you know, talked about a lot of headaches, agitation. Um, so the good part of so far was the going to these emergency rooms and ER rehab, the length of stay was pretty strong. You know, it's like eight hours. You go symptomatic treatment, they get better, you send them back out there. But that's just the acute phase. We do, and as the more data comes out, we really don't even know what's gonna happen. So the symptoms resolve pretty quickly with symptomatic care, IV fluids, you know, benzos, uh, give them some antimatics, or sometimes you would really use a Haldol, you know, to give them a shot of Haldol for, for calmness, so that works. 
the key part is the severe symptoms of stroke, uh, you know, seizure, MI. Um, is that a possibility? Absolutely. You know, rhabdomyolysis, sometimes we don't think about that. People kind of take the, uh, the, the doses, put the lay down, put the tightening of the muscles, the damage to the muscle tissue, the CPK levels go up, all of a sudden it causes some damage in the kidneys. And if you don't hydrate those people, they can actually have some damage. Um, but less common is psychosis and hyperemesis. We've not seen as much as compared to the regular cannabis uh, effects of those stuff. So again, we know the short time effects, but we don't know the long term effects. So the question always comes up, well, what happens? You know, the synthetic cannabinoid use, and, you know, we, we look at this population risk. Which are this population that are causing this? So this study was done back in uh, 2000, published in 2017, talked about mostly who were using it were young and white male. Uh, as and this was taken from the Department of Health, some psychiatric hospitalizations, you know, about 948 patients they looked at in 2014. And about 110 of them were using synthetic cannabinoid. Uh, what's interesting about this is that they found out not only that, yes, the young males are using it, non-white and a younger age, but the problem that's now they're spilling over into homeless uh, uh, shelters and mentally ill guys. So that's our next population that we got to worry about. So who do we get in prison, right? We get a lot of mentally ill folks with substance abuse. And what's scary part is that sometimes treatment is not even available out in the community either. So then we all of a sudden holding the bag, taking care of these guys. So definitely a huge concern, not only the young ma males, uh, non-white, but also mentally ill and homeless pa uh, in, in, uh, patients. So this is an interesting st study that was done to say, well, people who regularly smoke pot, do they do synthetic also? You know, you would think, why? You know, why would you want to mix it with something else? Because you're already smoking pot, why not? Well, the study is limited because it's only about 42 patients when they were young males, racially diverse and high school graduates. You know, this was done in high school grad. So they all smoked tobacco and cannabis, every one of them. And yet about 86% smoked more than five days a week. Synthetic one. So we not only talk about cannabis, regular cannabis, they do synthetic. And 91% that said, yeah, they were all familiar with it and they all knew the, the side effects of it. So the question comes up, do we really educate our population to say, why would you mix two different things? You know, because again, the receptor that they're attached to is the same receptors. Uh, and of course, 50% reported smoking, you know, previously as well, and the 24% are currently using it as well. So we do know that a federal ban in 2011, right, smoked it to new high, so that's a, just a ban there. And of course, try to, we try to educate people to avoid new drugs. Uh, but the population that we have, obviously they think if, the, if this guy had this reaction, I probably would have a different reaction, let me try it out. So again, side effects, not thinking clearly. You know, headaches, dry mouth, and anxiety. So the, one of the things that kind of backtrack here a little bit is to say there are good effects of the cannabis. You know, we know it works in pain, right? It's a, there's a medicinal use as well uh, for pain. So we do know that regular cannabis works for neuropathic pain. There's some inter good inter literature out there to talk about that it does work and it seems to help. But certainly it's not like opiate type. So you can't say, hey, this is the same effect as I'm getting from the opiate. Uh, there is also modest effect in cancer patients. You know, there's some, some, some literature out there supporting that data as well. Uh, but remember, you gotta be careful what state you're in. Uh, make sure you study your legal laws that you don't wanna prescribe some of these things. What's interesting about that, you know, cannabis, uh, uh, when I was doing my residency, we prescribed it for AIDS patients, Marinol, right? It's the same stuff. Uh, but Obviously, we don't use as much, but again, the key part of the study, what he, this one was, that it really is potential damage to the memory deficits and cognitive impairment. So even when it is legal, yes, we are using for those reasons, it can still impair your, uh, your, your memory and, uh, you know, obviously this, the long-term studies will, be, will tell us to see how much damage that is. We do know some other side effects as well, but this was kind of interesting to you know that, yes, it is helpful in one part of it, but your cognitive impairment and memory deficits can also increase. So here's the, I love it, the danger of spicing it up. What happens, you know? Uh, we know the active component is very potent, but it's the, the issue that we really don't know the part is, is poorly characterized. So we don't know what, how many components are there and what component, you know, you almost have to do a gas chromatography or some PCR studies to, to take a look at this to see how many components are there. 
And like I mentioned earlier, the T, T, uh, Delta, uh, Delta 9 THC component, depending how you prepare it, there's about 112 different components of it. And how do you purify it? And that's a big issue. And the reason we talked about here is psychological and physiological effects. We already mentioned about some of the psych stuff and physiological component of it. You know, they are affecting both sides. Uh, the issue is we know the short-term effects, but not the long-term. But the data now is catching up with the, with the uses of uh, our synthetic drugs. Uh, and we'll show you some of the really specific data that uh, how it affects it. And it binds to the same receptor we talked about before, you know, the, the cannabis receptor C1 and C2. So the contaminants that are, that are part of the K2 or the synthetic substances are, are really what's causing, I think, more of the heartache for us because we have no idea what's mixed with it, uh, what's laced with it. Uh, we had one case where we detected a K2 with, with a fentanyl. Um, so when we did the drug testing, that showed up. Or is one of, this is the only one that showed up, but I'm not sure what else is there. So have you had an experience like that with, with synthetic testing? Have you come up with some other contaminant? Any, any states? Yeah. I, I have you have the opiate problems. <laughs> Yes. Yep. Bleeding. What Kathleen is referring to about four or five, maybe six weeks ago or eight weeks ago, a case in uh, uh, Illinois, Chicago, synthet a synthetic cannabinoids mixed with rat poison. And they actually, the guy was bleeding from everything you can think about the gums, the eyes, the rectum, and, you know, whatever. Uh, sources we could have, so that was pretty pretty dangerous. So again, people who buy it don't even know that, um, and so that was a pretty dramatic case. If you if you go, go YouTube it, you'll see the some bleeding dramatic pictures there. Uh, so again, the, you know the, all the things we talked about earlier: heart increasing heart rate, agitation, uh, irritable and drowsiness, delusion, hallucinations. They all occur. This is all true. Uh, just not only with K2 synthetic, the synthetic drugs, but also this whatever else is mixed with it. So you can imagine the synergistic effect you have from rat poison that Kathleen was talking about, or, or fentanyl pet mixed with something else, which we know is much more potent, right? It's almost like 100 times potent than morphine. So you can imagine you just have to put a very little amount of fentanyl in there to cause high effect of one of our patients. Um, so let's take a look at some of the data. Uh, what is causing some of the toxicity. So K2 has been known to cause toxic hepatitis. Now with some of these studies that I'm gonna show you are the really case studies, individual ones. They're not really um, related to multiple study, you know, control studies, but at least we know from anecdotal uh, reporting and or published data in uh, literature that this is a 45-year-old gentleman who came with the hepatocellular necrosis and worsening liver failure. So obviously the first thing we think about, hey, maybe he was taking acetaminophen or, or alcohol, you know, while that drug testing was negative. And the you know, treatment was the same as what we do with other liver failures. He was treated with an acetylcysteine and got better. So here we go again of the same use, not knowing what he was from, and attributed to possibly when, during, when we take some history from him to say, well, what are you doing? And found out that he was taking some synthetic uh, drugs and actually cause some toxic hepatitis. Now, this could potentially be dangerous, right? Could be life-threatening, and all of a sudden we look at it. If, if somebody have more cases like this, you look at a liver transplantation, and even if it's a Tylenol toxicity, the only thing that helps the best if they do have high levels, uh, and if it does not respond to the NSTLS cysteine, you're actually gonna end up having the transplant, you know, the liver transplant. Uh, so that's why even that Tylenol overdose in our younger, adolescent population is much more dangerous because they don't think all those things because something happened, I'm just gonna take a bunch of pills and this is what happened. But there have been cases of reporting for liver transplant as well. So this is potentially dangerous. Um, this, is, this is an interesting one that Kathleen kind of alluded to, but that was the rat poison that causes it. But you can also have immune thrombo thrombocytic per, uh, uh, purpura. So because the receptors for C2 are similar to what, what happens with the ITP. And this actually kind of binds to the platelets and reduces the number of platelets you have. So this can cause bleeding disorder as well. 
The good part is that which is treatable once you find out what it is, but to detect it is really tough. Sometimes you can't make a diagnosis of this uh, illnesses. Um, and the treatment was pretty, pretty straightforward. The prednisolone seemed to get better. But by the time you find out this is ITP, I mean, for, for the people who are the docs, uh, you can recognize this is really sometimes tough to diagnose it. It takes a while. And but in the meantime, the receptors are binding to this stuff and you're causing platelets, uh, drop in platelets, and you start to bleed. Um, so this is, again, not a benign stuff. That's very serious. Uh, one case, reported case of this, um, dangerous. But how do you tell our patients all this stuff? What about the, uh, for female reproductive, reproductive, uh, reproductive system, potential causing some damage to the fetus? We really don't know the, study, the data, but we know the data that's in mice causes some uh, a synthetic cannabinoid that can cause some ambiguous uh, effects in the short term. Right. Obviously, we can't do the studies in, in humans, but if you exp expound on the same data for mice to, to having the same effects in, uh, in, uh, in humans, you can see possibly that can cause some uh, damage to the fetus as well. So this is pretty, pretty compelling. Uh, that actually affects all, all the em embryo development, implantation there, and talks about placenta, uh, where, where it's attached. And so, you know, this is again one of those things we, people who are using these are young, young, uh, uh, young patients. So again, during pregnancy, you have to be careful. Obviously, we need more data to show what kind of damage uh, it does. This is again the acute kidney uh, injury from K2. Uh, Abuse are rapidly increasing where people use it, and there is really no treatment for this stuff. You know, we talked about rhabdomyolysis earlier, but that we do have some studies that talk about uh, acute kidney kid injury, but the, by the time you find out what it's from, we really don't have any treatment. I mean, I mean, there are lots of different causes of acute kidney injuries, and we can treat some of this. Some of them can be reversible, but it does take time. You know, it's just not gonna get better in a day or two days or two weeks or three weeks. It might take months to get better. Uh, but especially, the, we don't know the total effect of K2 plus whatever is there. You know, we, this is this assumption that while we did the drug testing, we, we did not find anything in the history said, yeah, he smoked K2, and that's what's caused it. But really have no idea. And the question comes up, what was else was laced with it? Uh, again, you know, what do you do? Your kidney failure, you end up going to dialysis, right? And, um, but the good news is that some of these are reversible. You know, so that's, there is some hope, but the question is how much do we translate it to our patients? Uh, look at the uh, management of acute toxicity. So as I mentioned earlier, that you know, the, for short-term effect, we can catch this pretty quickly. We do the symptomatic treatments, IV fluids, hydration, um, some benzos, and sometimes even Haldol, it does help. Uh, but this was, study was done back in 2012 and 2015 in New York City. And they found that, you know, the, 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 the rates were pretty high uh, for, for toxicity levels. And again, you know, the synthetic cannabinoid is scheduled drug one, right? We just can't prescribe it like a, you need special uh, licensing privilege for those. So the studies are still needed for, uh, you know, long-term effects and how the effective treatment is. Because right now, what we do most of the time, we have no idea what we're dealing with in the emergency room. So we end up doing all this hydration, fluids, and hopefully we hope for the best. Um, but this, this, uh, this acute effects are really easily, but the question comes out what happens after all this has been done. There is really no follow-up studies too. So people who are going to the emergency rooms for these acute toxicity levels, you know, most of the time we follow these people up, right? You know, if somebody had, say, heart attack or so, something else might be opiate up here, or, or overdosing, we actually send them back to the primary care docs and say, okay, go, go ahead and follow those study people up. Nobody follows these guys up, you know, so there is no uh, continuity of care, which also scares you to say, well, how, are we missing those side effects? Because, um, you know, if something does happen, how do we know this person really had this damage from K2 or it was something else? Um, so there's lots of work we have to do, lots of stuff we need to do, figure out what's going on. Uh, so this is our, our healthcare services.
So actually, I was pretty happy to hear Damon West's talk yesterday talking about that were health series of staff are really kind and empathy. I was proud to see my staff doing that. I mean, this, I, I wish I could show you his face. His face, eyes were rolling back, and he was slurring and moving and really wouldn't be able to talk. But he knew it was, it was K tier. So the credit we don't get from our staff is really our staff is pretty quickly responding. And this guy responded pretty quickly to IV fluids and hydration. So we really didn't even have to send him out there. But these are the things you're dealing with. And these are real cases. So any questions so far? Any comments? OK. Uh, so here's another one, really, a 23-year-old guy smoked K2. And as soon as he smoked K2, he developed fever. Um, and his heart rate went up. So I had no idea what happened. You know, to somebody to have that quickly fever development, obviously, you think about, hey, what's going on? Maybe some viral infection or something else. When they went to, when he went to the emergency room, they found his white count was pretty high. Of course, the sign of maybe infection, right? And then when we did the chest x-ray, they showed they had interstitial infiltrates. So all of a sudden, oh my God, he got a nasty pneumonia or something else happened. So here's the first case that smoking K2 caused the damage to his to the lungs pretty quickly. And this is right within the hours. It's almost like this how quickly it progressed. Uh, good news is that oh, the, you know, he got better within 24 hours. It's unheard of you know, for, the, for the docs in, in, the, in the audience. You get a chest x-ray like this, you think he's got all this other stuff going on, and it's resolved in 24 hours. So this is a case study which shows that it is reversible, but it is much more dangerous, too. If he had not gone to the emergency room, God knows what would happen. You know? uh, and drug screen was negative, got better just with symptom treatment. You give a little bit of benzos and Haldol for his agitation, and he recovered. Yes? Listen to you. <laughs> right? No, they don't. Right. Well, so what do you tell them? well, usually when we give the nurses give the report, you know, to the nurses in the emergency room, mm -hmm. we basically talk about what the symptoms he has right now, because you really don't want to miss out other stuff either. Right. You know, to say he's got this is what's going on, but we also suggest, depending on how the age of the the, the patient is, we might say that you know this K2 is prevalent in our system as well, so test them for drug screen as well. So they might do it, but they still do the other workup anyway. Um, but what happens is that we learned through our, one of the facilities in Lincoln that when we sent them to this hospital, they found out by the, they give them hydration, all this stuff, they get better. They, you know, heart rate goes down, everything goes better, he comes out of his uh, confusion state, and they send him back about three, four hours later. So we, they have learned some, and we have learned some. So now we also don't send everybody until we feel, based on clinical judgment of the nurses, to say, and I've told nurses, I'll support your decision-making process. If you think that we want to watch it here, let's watch them. Because, you know, the, the fear for the nurses are, you also have thousands of the inmates that you got to take care of. And I'm going to be tied up with this person for one hour. And then what happens, or two hours, you know, whatever that might be. Because he's still agitated. The guy that we did that showed you a video of, I mean, it took a couple of hours. So you had an officer tied up there, and you got a nurse who was tied up there. So. Then we kind of learn both ways. So we still have this uh, relationship with the ER, and sometimes they send telling us, why are you sending it to us? You know, it's K2. Well, we still have to. You know, if he doesn't get better, which I told nurses, watch maybe a half hour, 45 minutes. If you don't see the dropping in the heart rate, the, the respiration, then just send them. Just don't, don't take the chance. 
But then remember, you have to worry about your custody staff. And if especially if you're at a maximum facility, guess what? You got to take two staff members there, right? They're not happy with you either. So the weekend that when we sweat 12 people, you can imagine how much staffing issues were. Um, but we learn it. And I think this is one of the things we did. Uh, and our nurses are actually really good now. And the officers, too, you saw when you heard the guys screaming in the back, you said, oh, that's a K2. They know all of a sudden what the, side is, the symptoms and side effects are. You know, at least the short-term part of it. But uh, the, that doesn't preclude from the emergency room to do other testing, and they have to do those testing, because if I was in their shoot, I would be doing this as well. But like Kathleen talked about, on the East Coast, they don't have this problem, this their heroin and opiate epidemic. Midwest, we seem to have stuck with K2, so we have a lot more K2 there. And we don't have heroin epidemic. I think the uh, data for Nebraska uh, for uh, heroin overdose, it's one death every three days, which is, yeah, which is not as bad. I don't know what Iowa is. Do you know, Kathy? Yeah, or South Carolina or Kansas? No. Yeah. So it's, it's really, it's not there yet. We don't see the opiate stuff as much as we do. And most of the places actually, uh, the, the UNMC has started just the MAT program just recently, thinking that it's gonna probably come our way. It's in Ohio, uh, you know, probably has in Illinois as well, but Iowa is still safe, I believe, and Nebraska, we don't see it yet. But, you know, so that's more of an education for our point of view that we have more focused on the K2 and the synthetic drugs, not anything else. And I, I could tell you the I-80 that comes from Colorado to go to Iowa, our police officers stop, I don't know how many tons of, you know, cannabinoid, uh, the, the, the catch and store transportation out there. And I'm sure Iowa is the same way, transporting back to Chicago, that's an I-80, they catch the, the interstate that goes through this other state. But, but this is what's dangerous though. I mean, you smoke K2 one time and within hours, you have this chest infiltrations, uh, just like you have a pretty serious disease. And I'm sure this guy probably was hypoxic, developed fever, you know, so you know he's probably producing some kind of toxins related to that one too. Uh, and what's strange about it is it gets better in 24 hours. Chronic cases? No, we have not. Five years, well that's good, yeah. What's, so what's your experience with that one? So what does he have physical symptoms wise or side effects? Even when he's using it or when he doesn't? Nothing, nothing that, yeah. So I think those are the studies that will come out and that we need to know really the, what the long-term side effects are. We really don't know. And this is the data that I'm showing is all uh, literature supported data. So, and I think that's what's gonna happen. That's why we have individual cases in the reported literature. So that'd be one nice one to write it up. Maybe you should have somebody consider writing that case up. You know, be, so people learn from that process. Um, so what about the uh, adolescent, right? We talked about the younger guys, but what about high school graduates? So this study was done back uh, 2011 to 2015. It's 54,000 kids, 13 to 19, attending high school. And what they showed, the good news is that in 2011, there were 11% or 12% were using synthetic. So the numbers have dropped, you know, 2015 by 4.75, so 5% which is good, we go in the right direction. But what they looked at in this study was also, what about your socioeconomic status? I mean, if you're higher socioeconomic status or lower economic status and see where you were. So this was interesting that uh, the higher socioeconomic status kids remain at higher risk than the, the older cohort and the lower socioeconomics. So, um, which kind of stands to reason, we kind of what uh, Damon West talked about yesterday, you know, he had all the, privileges in the world, but still end up using drugs, right? Uh, end up on the wrong path. So here it shows that even though the trend is down, but still the higher socioeconomic kids tend to use more. Uh, it's also higher risk in adolescent, uh, Hispanic, uh, other mixed races, cigarette users, and uh, frequent marijuana users as well. You know, we also know from the data that we're showing, this actually tend to be much more higher morbidity and mortality as well. And I think the lady just talked about chronic ones. That's gonna be the interesting one to see how we really react in about a couple of years from now on. Because if somebody is using chronically, like you know, we, we know people are using in our system, 
we have probably haven't caught up with those. It's just like meth use, right? If you about 10 years ago, we didn't know what the meth uh, use side effects going to be down the road. And when I was in Iowa, we had people in the 30s who actually were behaving early dementia, right? So they had forgotten some things, the memory relapses were going on. They now was kind of scared at that point to say, I don't know what's gonna happen in 10 years, we might have a whole room full of, actually the whole housing unit full of younger guys who are demented. Uh, fortunately, it hasn't caught that bad in Iowa that I know of, but Nebraska, we haven't seen that either. But the, I'm told meth is coming back. Uh, South Dakota was told me, I think Randy, you were talking about you know, uh, Ohio as well. So meth is also already seeing a resurgence uh, back again. Uh, that's even much more dangerous product that you can think of. Easy to make, probably cheaper to sell, so you know, who knows. Uh, this is another case study. Uh, a young, um, of course, pretty had, you know, after, sm after uh, smoking K2, had agitation and bizarre behavior. So taken to the emergency room, hospitalization, they found his CPK levels very high, in about 10 to 20,000 levels. Usually it's about 100 or so. Uh, he had a normal renal function, so in a high dehydration treatment, he got a lot better, and they watched him, CPK levels also dropped. Again, if he had not seen anything else, stayed at home, uh, rhabdomyolysis could have probably damaged his kidneys. And most people don't do it. I mean, I think we see rhabdomyolysis for a lot of different reasons, too. People drink alcohol and pass out and stay in one position. There's, of course, the damage of the tissue. I guess there's sometimes compartment syndrome developed with, the, with the elevated CPK levels. So there's lots of different reasons for it, too. So K2 might be some of one of those things, except in this case, it was agitated. I mean, I've seen rhabdomyolysis, actually, we do, even people who are working out, exercising, you know, so. So that's part of the things you have to also keep that in mind. We had a guy, I think Kathy from Iowa was there, which, uh, she was a psychologist. Uh, we had a guy who was actually lifting weights. Uh, had blood pressure about 200 and 110. Uh, he had a stroke just from, from that episode. Um, again, what do you do, ban weightlifting? Of course, that's, you know, they all come in after you, why you do do with it? But this is exactly what the symptoms he had. Um, so we're seeing lots of different things, lots of different variety of uh, challenges that we face. Um, so the more we learn about the symptoms, a lot better. So the interesting study that this one is, pediatric patients, heart attack. You know, we never think of those things, right? In a pediatric population, we showed you the data from 19 to, I mean 13 to 19, so somebody's 13 years old or 14 years old using K2. Uh, this person had actually had a heart attack, yeah, ischemic infarction, arrhythmias, you know, just they missed it because there were no symptoms. You know, probably didn't know how to tell them. Um, so this is dangerous. Again, you know, this is younger people, population is younger and younger. I remember all the studies that I'm showing you is outside the world. It's not even a correctional world. But you can imagine if that's out there in the outside the world, what's in correctionals? You know, it's probably 10 times as higher than everything else is. So if for juvenile facilities, this is something to think about. Uh, we have 60 juveniles in Nebraska, so we worry about there as well. Um, kids who are coming in about 14, 15 year olds, uh, and eight, up to 18. Uh, they have, we, luckily we have not seen K2 there as much. What's the other population that we have spared is women or women prison. You know, we, uh, my boss actually asked me if I could put together a K2 video for, for inmates, so we did and we put the video together on a TV system to show. So I told my health educator to say, we just put them on all the TV system, every facility. She went to women's prison, the women warden said, no, I don't wanna see it. So what do you mean? He said, we don't have K2 problem. I don't wanna introduce this if you bring a video in, they think, oh, this is really great. But what we have in women's prison is pill parties. So they all mix the pills together and they party on that one. So we have a different set of problems. So, so it was kind of interesting how to say that she was against the idea of educating people for K2, yet thinking that they might introduce K2 in her prison. So we decided, okay, we won't do it, but I don't know what we can do at the pill parties, because I, I don't know about you, but my state has about 76% of our patients are on, uh, in a women's prison on, on, on medications. And you wonder how many of them really needed it. You know, we decided to take out all the narcotics in Nebraska. I have. I don't know if your state, any state has that. We only have 25 people in narcotics right now. We, we had about 500 when I started last year, so when the epidemic, opiate epidemic was out there talking about CDC came with some guidelines, we decided to take everybody off. And you know how many complaints I had? 
I would have thought I would have, the, the press would be knocking on my door, zero. I have zero grie grievances by stopping all narcotics. I have more complaints stopping the over-the-counter medications than stopping their hydrocodone. You know, why can't I get my uh, Prabhu second? Why don't I get my Tums and, you know, this kind of stuff? So it goes to show you, I have no idea what happened. I think it's just probably we're being strong-armed to get some other narcotics for somebody else, and they probably would have leave. So, but I don't know what to do about pill parties in women's prison. If anybody has ideas, I'd love to hear about those. Um, so this is, the, this is the other one. A real, really scary slide because you know, we talk about synthetic cannabinoids. Right, right now, we talk about single organ system failures. We talk about the kidneys, we talk about heart attack, we talk about lung affecting. This case was a 45 year old guy had multi organ system failure. You know, obviously, we don't know his history behind it, but still, I'm sure he had some other historical, you know, uh, uh, comorbid diseases. But this talks about that, in it just detect, you know, we can't detect in urine, so there's no way to do it. But the receptors that we talked about earlier, the CB1 and 2, they're widespread, so they could be, they can bind anywhere, just not on the brain as well. So all, all of a sudden, this guy had a heart attack. He had a subarachnoid bleed. He also had cardiomyopathy, acute rhabdomyolysis that we talked about earlier. So this guy had bad luck uh, in a severe metabolic derangement. And first, you know, this is the first case of combined effects. So imagine if this kind of things happen in our system we would have a lot more sick people. And I don't even know, which is kind of interesting on this one, you know, this is a 45-year-old guy. The question comes up, most of them are the young who's, who are probably pretty healthy. What happens if the, you know, our population is, getting, is aging also and we're getting older uh, inmates as well. What about if they use that? What kind of a comorbid conditions we will have? I mean, this could be a case where he would end up spending a lot of time in ICU. You know, we talked about the length of stay was, Acute cases was pretty quick and short, and they, get, and they could get out of there and recover pretty quickly. And there is no follow-up, right, like we just talked about. There is really no follow-up who's going to monitor this guy. Obviously, the prison system, we do, but we really don't look for it. I mean, we don't put this guy in a chronic care clinic. We don't, you know, he overdosed at one time, and that's it. You know, we'll see you whenever. I mean, I don't know if anybody follows that. Uh, it might be some, some thoughts to think about that to say, hey, what do we do? Should we keep track or tab on these guys? Is something else going to develop? But this is what scares me. You know, having multi-organ system failure uh, just from getting high. And look at this one. We talked about it earlier the suicide effect. Uh, Twenty-year-old guy published data. Uh, you know, this is the Oklahoma State Medical Association. Actually, is a case study. That's what I talked about. Maybe you should look at the case study you have for chronic care uh, uh, symptoms. This guy came with agitation, confusion suicide ideation and self-inflicted trauma. So he was actually trying to kill himself. Uh, and a physical exam showed that he was agitated, he was abrasion, respiratory about 30, he was tachycardic, he had the drug screen was negative, nothing there. Uh, they did the symptomatic treatment and his symptoms totally got better within 24 hours. So when they asked him, hey, why do you try to kill yourself? He said, oh no, I didn't do it, I don't remember. So here we have guys so try to, you know, self-injurious behavior, secondary to K2. I mean, how many people you, in your system you have who are self-injurious, right? And hopefully not, not everybody's on K2. I mean, I have a couple of ones that really take lots of over time just to watching the one person. Uh, can you imagine if K2 side effects, somebody has those things? And potentially, you know, lethal. I mean, he could have done damage to himself. Uh, luckily, luckily, in this case, he got a lot better. So something to keep in mind. Um, this is an interesting data I've talked about hospitalization associated with uh, K2 use. We show, you know, right now we've talked about that it's really just short term. You know, right now, if eight hours, 24 hours, they get better. But this study was done with 17 patients who had 21 admissions within, you know, four months. And four of the four patients had the, they were the first admission. And 13 had previous admissions and nine had recurrent pre-existing disorders, and four had new psychotic symptoms. I hate to be that ER doc, seeing these people all the time, right? Kind of think, of, what do I do now? And the length of stay when they looked at this data was about 8.5, but if you had psychotic symptoms, that could vary anywhere from 13 plus days. 
but the multi-organ system that we talked about, now people who are recurrent users, we're finding out that they end up actually spending more time in the, in the hospital, uh, not just for acute care, but also for chronic care. Sometimes people are in ICU, and I'll show you some data on that one. Uh, it's pretty impressive. Oh, here's the data. So they talked about the clinical characteristic of patients using synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, 39,000 cases. So this is not a small study. Yeah, it's huge. From 2010 to 2015, look how many cases that actually had toxicity, 353. And they broke it down further about how many were agitated, 146, you know, agitation, delirium, and toxic psychosis. Now imagine, these are some of our patients. This is what we deal all the time, right? Uh, especially if you had a mental health unit, this is what happens all the time. And look at the people with elevated heart rate, about 100, you know, 140, more than 140. And this is the other part that kind of scares me, or the decreased heart rates. So far, we talked about mostly having elevated heart rates. You know, I mean, we can always do something about that. Can you imagine having a low heart rate? You have no choice but to send some, somebody to the ER, almost looking at a kind of external pacemaker and or some other uh, side effects to reverse that process. So 20 had decreased heart rate. 15 had hypotension. We talked about being able to people with hypertension. Hypertension is even dangerous. Uh, that can cause a lot more uh, problems. And 59 seizures. We've seen seizure quite a bit. So there's quite a few of patients had a seizure disorder. Um, so the pharmacological treatment for with, with benzos, again, it's all the same thing we talked about. You know, benzos, IV fluids, antipsychotics. 167 were treated in the emergency room. They sent them back, which is wonderful. But it also, for a correction system, that's really taxing because I can't send all these people out to the emergency room every time something happens. But you can't ignore all the data that's coming out with the multi-organ system failure, heart attacks and everything else, seizure disorders. What do you do? You know, you don't want to take that chance. So if you were watching uh, some of these things in, in your clinics or your sniff area, be very careful. Make sure they're taking vital signs much, you know, a lot frequent than you should. Because we sometimes get lax about it. You know, I'll take 15 minutes or so. But no, I think you should be very careful, you know, because you got to treat these people like they're in ICU setting. Uh, and look at 42 were admitted to the hospital and 67 were admitted to, to ICU. I mean, that's a lot of people. You know, maybe the fraction for 30, 40,000 compared to 67 is not much, but this is for one drug, you know, K2 induced uh, uh, ICU setting. So the data is coming out there, and the public, you know, the, the literature is actually starting to support some data that how dangerous this stuff is. And also, they're so unpredictable. Um, so we really have to be careful of how we manage. And this is, you know, one of the things that I always kind of st struggle with my staff is like, this is what we need in addition to what we're doing, right? We have chronic cases all the time. We have H HIV patients. We have, a, you know, Hep C patients. We got to watch them. We got a diabetics. We got to watch them. We got dialysis patients. We got to watch them. You know, we have MIs, congestive heart failure guys, COPDs, and now we have this problem on top of that. Um, forget about the opiate stuff. We know that what does that. And methamphetamine is in a big, if there's a resurgence, you know, it's the Midwest, I think we combined with this one, it's even gonna be, uh, the, 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 the symptoms will probably would have a synergistic effect and we wouldn't even know where to go. And you know, curious about the, the chronic cases where we're gonna end up with uh, some of this long-term use. Um, but this is kind of the literature support showing you, you know, we have so far, this is probably the first time we kind of presented a seminar like this to say, there are side effects, there are medical side effects. Yes, you are damaging your body because we, when we tell our young guys out there, they don't believe you. But now we have the data to support it to say, you know, it is dangerous, it is gonna hurt you, uh, potentially life-threatening. And uh, so there's a whole gamut of stuff that I presented to you guys here today. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, uh, also not to undermine, you know, the problem that is like, put down this is not your grandfather's marijuana because that's what people think, you know. Everybody else smoked pot way back when and now it's the same thing. But they forget it's a synthetic product. It's not the same thing. You know, there's a lot more dangerous in the predictability of the concentration and or this laced with something else. Uh, yeah, it causes some of the, uh, you know, dangerous side effects. So I love this picture of my cat. It's kind of like. <laughs> okay, well, you know, it's like. Okay, I didn't put you to sleep. Maybe I put her to sleep when I'm talking to her. So any comments, any questions for me or any suggestions? Yes, Kathleen. So what is the security strategy that you're trying to do? Yes.
right? Uh, that's what I struggle all the time. I said, this product is coming from outside. You know, we do have, so Lincoln has a prison in, in town, so you know, really the traffic is all over the place. So I do, you know, one of the claims is they just throw it over the fence, which probably does happen, I believe that, some of it does, but not to that level, that weekend when we had that many cases. Uh, so I'm sure that some staff is bringing it in. We have caught two staff members who brought it in, and they're supposed to do checks, you know, pad searches every time, but you know, I walk into some of the maximum, they don't even check me. You know, I don't even have to take my jacket off to go through the scanner, walk right in. It's like, so part of that is a problem. And when you try to bring the custody, obviously you have, bit, you, know, you have to be very careful because you've got to work with this custody staff. So maybe just one or two guys are probably bad who bring it in. You don't want to taint the whole system because they are very helpful in trying to do all those things. And they understand. I think they also recognize that whoever is bringing it in, putting our own staff members in danger. You know, I mean, we have to be careful because when we do this, we need to protect ourselves from each other. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge problem. I think majority of the public is from custody. But we also heard about people sending letters uh, with, with the children coloring something and that's paste, laced over some drugs in that too. So I know some states are actually making copies of it. Ar uh, is it Arkansas? Yeah, Arkansas is actually making copies of every letter and not giving them or scanning it. And then they don't give the original to the, to the inmates. They're destroying the original ones or keeping somewhere else because they found that actually stopped some of the drugs. Um, but I think if you do the security up front, that will minimize, that will drop some, the number of cases. I don't know, do you have any point from an administrative point of view? Somebody from administration there? I, I agree, it's tough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a huge problem, right? The security is there, but it still happens. Okay, we, here's the other thing too. We walked two nurses out last week <clears throat> because she was bringing cell phones in. And she was getting paid. She brought, like two weeks ago, two, six cell phones, got $2,500 cash. So finally she admitted she brought 68 cell phones the past nine months. And she's a 10 year employee. And you have to say, you're putting our lives in danger. What are you thinking? You know, I mean, this is what it's, I think the olden days, I'm old, I guess when I, when I started working way back, we had a lot of camaraderie of with our staff to say, I want to protect you, you know, my colleagues. We don't see that now, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to bring this stuff in, and, but you're putting my nurses in danger, you know, because whatever else is they're running the business from inside. Our staff members, custody staff, you know, they don't even think about it. They, I don't think she saw there's anything wrong with it. Uh, but I always wanted to know what triggered that, or how did she get caught into that? You know, once you get caught into this, you, they, it's hard to get out. Um, then you actually end up, so one nurse admitted to that, and the second nurse actually says, oh, I wanna go into her locker. And then we said, why are you interested in her locker? So of course, then when we searched her locker, she had some cell phones. So, and it all happened to be, the way it was caught, uh, the medical porter actually was transferred from one facility to the other. Now the connection was broken. So he told some other inmate to say, hey, this is what you want to go through. And that's how we found out. Otherwise, who knows? And she was the one who was working overtime all the time, weekends. You know, we said we loved it. This person is really volunteering to work all this stuff. And guess what? She was bringing people, young guys, into blood pressure checks. Now when we go back, look at it, who was she bringing in? Young guys that don't bring, you know, how do you tell your nurse don't bring people for blood pressure checks, right? But when you compromise your ethics there. Uh, now we're kind of going back and say, okay, what happened? So we need to be careful. Plus, and my biggest thing is really we got to take care of ourselves. So any other comments, suggestions? Yes. What about um, like prolonged stay psychiatric episodes? Do you have cases where you can't give this meth or something unpredictable but a lot of radiation or some of these medical problems on the same basis? It's, yeah, no, we don't. It's all kind of combined together. But meth is part of the problem as well. You're right. And I don't even know what else is really mixed with it. So sometimes with the smoke and all the not detectable and stuff. But it'd be interesting. I don't know. Have you, have, how's your experience been?
You're right. Well, you're absolutely right. But uh, when I was in Iowa, we published the data back in 16. It was published data last year. Uh, we did a study in our system to figure out how long does it take to diagnose somebody with mental illnesses. And it actually took us six years. So that's how and part of the issues that you talked about is that what we don't know is part of pre-morbid conditions there, was the drug issues or what had happened. So to sort those things out, actually with every diagnosis we had, uh, it took about six years to say this is truly mental illness and the other ones were not. Remember that's why the old DSM-4 talked about you know, rule out or NOS. So this is all gone now. My psychiatrist is actually struggling with those, some of the diagnosis to say, okay, well, I don't know what it is, but it, it, you know, it might not be this because this drug was used. So the, it also puts us more for us to think about it and say, how do we address this diagnosis? So I kind of put down, put presumptive diagnosis, this is what it is, but we need to work it out. But our data that we put, we, see, we, we had a health record, uh, electronic health record. So we were able to do a lot of retroactive studies and um, chart reviews, but we found out that every patient that we had found, it took about six years to diagnose correct diagnosis. So, I mean, I'm sure we are over-diagnosing quite a bit because of some of the substance abuse issues, and uh, you know, which is true. I'm not sure, Randy, you have any thoughts on those because you've become a lot of work in that area as well. But that was one published data last year that we found. But I know my psychiatrists always struggle because you know, when he moves from reception to somewhere else, then they say, I don't see the same symptoms, I don't see the same history, so which one came first? But that's really a dilemma for us. Any, anybody else? Any comments? Hold on, I was just going to mention that um, you, know, you wonder the impact of this on staff. You yes. Know, the, kind of the trauma on staff having to deal with some of these violent episodes and how much support we're going to need for some of our staff to keep them. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's really because they are the front lines, and that's why you know, we talk about security. I really want to work with them as a multidisciplinary team because they're all part of us, just because we have one or two who are bad, because they really deal with the stress. You saw the guy. You know, but the two videos that I showed you, the last guy was very empathetic to the patient because he wanted to do the right things, but he's also very stressful, you know, trying to bring him out there. And then the other one who was screaming out there, the team being called, and they have no idea what's going on. But even though he thought it was K2, because after we see the pattern, but it's still scary. You know, you don't know what's gonna be behind that door because he covered the, the glass window behind it and he might be screaming for whatever reason. But it's a lot of trauma, and we do a lot of de-escalation with our staff as well. But behavioral health is pretty proactive in that sense. So every cases like this happen with incident reports, we'll do some briefing. Uh, and you're right, the trauma that our staff faces is pretty enormous. Uh, so anything we can work together is great. And certainly, I'd be love to have any suggestions from you. Have and you know, we did a quite a literature search. Uh, our experience with K2 is uh, quite extensive. Midwest didn't really think it would be that much, but it's, then, you know, I was really surprised when a woman's warden said, "I don't have any K2 problem." I said, "Okay, what do we need to do? Why can't we do the same things we're doing for what are you doing here?" But but we have a different problem on the other side. So, well, again, thank you for your participation. Thank you for listening to this. I appreciate it. And there's a lot of other uh, synthetic cannabis talks in this uh, session. Um, they're talking about a lot of different trauma, how do we take care of ourselves, and you know, appreciate the input you guys have. Again, thank you. If you guys could please fill out your evaluation forms and just bring them up to the